Wednesday? Yeah, you do Sunday. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, let's uh, let's start out with uh, number sixteen in the supplement here. <clears throat> number sixteen pierced my ear. Pierce my ear, O Lord, my God. Take me to your door this day, for I will serve no request from Jackson. Um, always a good song to sing. So, Battle Belongs to the Lord, number 48 in the supplement. <clears throat> In heaven the armor will enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. 
No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. Now have our opening prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we come before you this evening, we're thankful for this day, for the opportunity to be here tonight, that we might sing these songs of praise unto you thankful for all the many blessings that you have given to us, that you've been mindful toward us in so many ways. You provide the things that are necessary for us in life in such a bountiful way, but most of all, Father, we're thankful for the spiritual blessings that we have in our Savior, that we have hope of eternal life and forgiveness of our sins because of his death and shedding of his blood on the cross. We pray, Father, that we might take these things very seriously and realize that without his death that we have no hope in this life. We pray that you'll be with those that we know that are suffering at this time, some family members of members here, and we pray your blessing on them as they go through different trials and uh, treatments. We pray, Father, that you would be with them and strengthen them if it be your will. We pray that you'll be with Andrew tonight as he brings us study and the lesson we're thankful for him and logan and the work that they do here and we pray that you might continue to be with them and strengthen them be with our leaders that govern us and we know sometimes father that we um, fall short of the things that you would have us to do and but we pray that you know they might look into your word and your will and lead us in such a way that we might continue to enjoy freedom that we have in this country Forgive us of our sins as we repent of them, for we fall short of the things that you have governed or put out for us, and we pray that you would forgive us of those things. Go with us now as we go through this service tonight. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, for, uh, for our classes this evening, let's also, in the supplement, turn to number 88. 88. We shall assemble on the mountain, we shall assemble at the throne, with humble hearts unto his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the Redeemer. 
We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts unto his presence. We bring an offering of song. Glory and honor and dominion. Unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. Well, now our class. Turn to Acts 18. <clears throat> All right, so which journey are we on? Second. Second. And where has he just been as a Sunday? Okay, Philippi, well, that was a couple Sundays ago. Philippi, then what? Athens. Athens, okay. So he went to, it was a Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and then we left off Sunday in Athens. And so we are finishing up the second missionary journey tonight in chapter 18, where he ends here in Corinth. And then we'll start the third journey. <clears throat> so chapter 18, um, this is probably a little bit of a review from when we discussed this when Logan uh, started his first Corinthians class. We're going to talk about some of the similar things in the introductory class. I think I taught that for him. So this may be uh, just a little bit of a refresher. But verses, let's just, let's just look at a few verses here starting out beginning in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So... Um, Paul does some critical things while he's in Corinth. Uh, he plants the church here, and he's also going to write First and Second Thessalonians while he is here. And these are that which makes this just a really crucial stay for Paul. And in verse one, uh, it says that he left Athens and went to Corinth. If you drop down to verse eleven for a moment, it says he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So he stays for a year and a half in this area that allows him to establish the church and allows him to write uh, these books. Um, Cor Corinth, um, what do we know about Corinth? It's a major city. Okay, it's a major city. It's a major, ma ma major. this isn't cars, the movie Cars. Um, it is in the middle of two large gulfs, um, the Corinthian and the Saronic uh, gulfs. And 
This is sometimes another major city is the Ismia, um, slightly northeast of Corinth. And I have these, this map, but again, every time I get up here, it, it, Logan it always works for him. But um, anyway, Ismia, which is close to uh, Corinth, that's where those, the Isthmian games, um, those Olympic games similar to the Olympics, that's where those were taking place. Every two years they would do that. And you'll recall in, in Paul's letter to 1 Corinthians, he talks about running with endurance, um, a race that's set before you. And so, or um, like, a, you know, what was he talking when he talks about the boxers be- beating the air? Um, probably it has something to do with that surrounding area in those games that took place. He probably had a, a thought, hmm, this, this um, seems to work, work well. Um, it was also um, a pretty, pretty uh, safe city from enemies. So you had really Corinth or Acro Corinth is 1,500 feet of elevation. And so there was a, it was a pretty um, high up and they could uh, be protected from anything that would come their way. And also a very economical city. So, you know, they had a lot of port areas, and so a lot of traffic was coming in and out of there. It was a very religious city. Um, There's a lot of paganism that took place. They were diverse in paganism. And because of that, a lot of the sailors would travel into that area, actually, and would have a lot of influence on the city, bringing in their own religions. And so that, that makes this a little bit more of a challenge for Paul, quite amazing that that he has such success here given all of that and so um, you know you can go look up sometime archaeologists have found different fragments of these temple shrines that would have been there during Paul's time but anyway in verse 2 through 3 who does Paul uh, who does he meet while in Corinth yeah Aquila and Priscilla and what happens? Where are they from? What are they doing? They've been kicked out of Rome. Yeah, they've been kicked out of Rome. And that is because of Emperor Claudius, who ordered the Jews out of the city. Um, you know, you, have, you can go and read about that in secular history, too. There's uh, Suetonius, a Roman historian, uh, said that they were ordered out because of this continuance stir- disturbance at the instigation of Crestus. That is a, a secular historical document that really Crestus, what he probably meant there was Jesus Christ. And he writes about how they were kicked out because of their, um, their loyalty to Jesus. So uh, that's why they're on the move. And so they come here to Corinth and Paul lives with them. And what's he doing? He's working. He's a tent maker. So he didn't just evangelize. He didn't just do the work of of preaching. He also did secular work. And um, remember why that would have been important to the church at Corinth? He reminds them that he didn't take any money from them. That's right. So in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians... um, he, you know, he can say, I really, I really um, received support for many of these churches. Um, I actually, when I needed some money, I would work with my own hands. Um, I didn't just lay around waiting for it to, to happen for me. Um, so he couldn't be rightfully accused, right, of taking advantage of others. And so that would have played a part here in the city of Corinth. Uh, Verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So again, that's his his big thing. I mean, that's a pattern in his life. Any city he hits, he finds those Jews in the synagogues and he goes to teach them. He's a busy man throughout the week. And then he spent time teaching and reasoning with the Jews. Sometimes, um, you know, on the weekends, that's when the synagogues were basically open. And who comes to meet him in Corinth here? If you, verse 5. Yeah, Silas and Timothy. And I've always, this is always an interesting verse. I like this verse uh, because it, it maybe, 
explains a little bit of, of some of the things, some of the reasons why they come. Um, they had been sent to Thessalonica by Paul in Acts 17. Uh, most likely, when Paul wrote the letter, upon, is, he most likely writes 1 Thessalonians upon their arrival to him here in Corinth. So, what do you think, um, what does it mean when Paul is, it says that he's occupied with the word? Compare that to verse 3. Tent making, and now he's occupied with the word. He's got a couple full-time jobs. Okay, he's got a, a couple of full-time jobs. Or maybe now that they have returned, he can now shift his focus to <coughs> hidings with them. Okay. Something of that nature, so now he's fully occupied with the word versus working in his duty set. So... Yeah, so I think there are a couple of things that are possible here. Um, it could be that he's doing all of this. He's doing the tent making. He's reasoning in the synagogues with Jews, and he's writing or occupying his time with the Word, which I probably probably means study and writing letters to the, to the churches. Um, my guess is, is that Silas and Timothy have probably come down and have been able to give him support or some kind of uh, some some money so that he can stop his tent making work and he can devote himself fully to this. Um, that is another option as to why he is able to occupy himself so fully now. And that would be I, I think that's probably one of the things that has happened is Silas and Timothy have gotten money from other churches, and they're able to come to Paul and say, "Here is some some money." So you can stop your work so that you can do the work um, for these other churches that you're writing to or spending your time in the Word of God even more. So logically, I think that they probably brought him support. Um, but what crisis comes up in verse 6? Yeah, when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and he said, your blood be on your own head. So the Jews are opposed to him. They revile him just like he, I mean, this isn't anything new. He has experienced this in other places as well. And he wipes his sandals off as a judgment of sorts. And so he says, I'm going to focus my attention on the Gentiles. And so not all is lost. If you look at verse 7. It says, he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. All right, so the Jews who are of the synagogue are reviling him. And, you know, he's doing the smart thing here. He's, he's got these people that are all over him trying to, to rile things up, persecute him. And, hey, well, let's just stay next door to where these, these guys hang out. And so that's what he does. He stays right next door with this worshiper of God. And in verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So Crispus, uh, the synagogue leader, was converted to the Lord with his whole house. And then it just kind of escalates from there. Many Corinthian citizens begin to catch on. Hey, this is an interesting message. Let's, let's, let's pay attention. And so they start to be converted. Um, now, verse 9, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So, you know, we get this idea sometimes that, uh, the, you know, the apostle Peter and Paul, they were persecuted, but they're in the prisons. They're not really, uh, they don't seem to be whining and crying about it. Uh, they seem to be handling this pretty well, which they do. That does not mean that there wasn't fear. Doesn't mean that, you know, they were just, they took this like it was, um, just having a quiet day at the house. Uh, Paul seems to be a little bit um, 
fearful of the things that are going on here. And that's why God comes to him and says, don't be afraid. I mean, that implies you're a little bit afraid, right? Fine, you turn off. Um, and so God has to ensure him or assure him that he wouldn't be attacked in the city. And as you can tell by what Paul has been doing here, it's pretty evident. God says, I've got, I've got a lot of people in this place. Isn't that kind of cool? Um, it, it's kind of like if you're going on a vacation and you're going to worship somewhere and you run into people you, uh, that know other people that you know and you just kind of connect the dots. God has people everywhere. And there's no reason to be afraid or to fear. Um, it's kind of like Elijah, you know, when God had to point out, hey, look, I got all these people, and I just kind of get that same picture from this. And, yeah. You know, even, even when things might seem bleak, you know, God sees a lot that we don't see. Right. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, you know, Elijah got, he got to thinking he was, he was the only one there, right? Um, that was a, a survivor of faith, and God reminds me, I've got people everywhere. You just, you just hold on to me, and uh, Paul's doing the same thing. That's a good point. It's a good comparison. All right, somebody want to read 12 to 17? Anybody? But when Gallio was preconsul of Archaea, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. All right, so this kind of gives you a picture of how Romanized the Corinthian city has become. And from a political standpoint, uh, Rome typically placed governors uh, in cities, sometimes called them proconsuls. And that's what we have here in this man, Gallio. Um, he was actually, uh, you, we've, we've talked about this before, but he was the brother of a very famous Stoic philosopher, Seneca. And that's who Gallio is. And he actually, Gallio is pretty important because he can help date the book of 1 Corinthians. So, um, you know, we have inscriptions. and uh, There are inscriptions on this computer right here that would um, share that with you, uh, that found that Gallio's name was embedded on some of these, um, these stones that they have uncovered. And uh, Julius Caesar uh, put him in charge about 50 to 51 AD, approximately. And this particular event in chapter 18 was probably around 52. So, um, and your, some of your Bibles may have footnotes about that, but that kind of... Um, kind of can help us date a little bit where 1 Corinthians would have been. Um, according to 1 Corinthians, uh, do you mind where, where Paul was when he wrote that letter? Next chapter. 19. Yeah, must have been Ephesus. Um, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8, I think talks about that as well. About three years or so later is when he does that. So 52 AD, um, probably uh, plus one and a half years here in Corinth, and then another three years is probably about 55 or 56 when he wrote Corinth. So Gallio is an important figure for those various reasons. But he is specifically brought to this tribunal, this judgment seat. Um, and you can see pictures of that seat uh, on Google, uh, they I, I think I don't know they call it the Bema or something like that. There's this little judgment seat that they sit you there and you get put on um, uh, kind of well I don't know what you, you get put on like in almost in a court system like you, you got to give your defense 
in front of people. And so all, remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, all will appear at the judgment seat of God. And that was in 2 Corinthians 5, and he's probably thinking about this bima, or this judgment seat that they put him on here in front of Galileo, or Gal <laughs> did I say uh, Galileo? I tried to. <laughs> Galileo, excuse me, and the proconsul. Um, so anyway, that's probably what he has in mind. So Gallio basically says, well, what, what's he think of this? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, this is a wash, guys. I mean, this is not something, this is an important squabble um, that you Jews are getting all upset about. Um, these are matters that really I could care less about. So let's just kind of pick up the loose ends here and let's move on with this. See to the matter yourself. This is not something I want to get involved in. Um, Roman governors didn't really want to waste their time in such matters, and he doesn't want to do that either. So he drove them from the tribunal, verse 16, and in verse 17, uh, interesting verse, they all seized Sosthenes. Um, they all, possibly the people that are part of the administrative court of Gallio, that is possible as to what, is, what, what the they there is, they all seized Sosthenes. And uh, who did and so Sosthenes? Um, I, I my guess is the old ruler of the synagogue that we just read about. Uh, he is now a Christian, and my guess is is that he probably got got the boot, and there's a new ruler. Is my guess. And Sosthenes is mentioned in First Corinthians chapter one, um, but that is my guess as to what. What happens? It's kind of a uh, a difficult thing to kind of figure out for sure. There, there seems to be a transition in these synagogue rulers. Um, all right. Any unfortunate for that guy <laughs> getting beat up like that? Any thoughts on any of that? In First Corinthians chapter one, verse one, mm -hmm. it says Paul called, called let me say it again. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sotson, Sotson, how do you say that? Right? Yeah. So is he the second synagogue leader to become a Christian? Um, well, I think that's possibly, I, I think that's kind of the, the question here is um, who these, is it the same synagogue ruler or are there different synagogue rulers? Um, but I, I, though I, most likely this guy here is the same guy in 1 Corinthians 1. I think we could probably say that. I mean, he got um, beat up for all that. It sounded like to me he decided what he'd been practicing all his life wasn't worth it. This guy may have something better and he yeah, decided to well, follow Paul. I mean, would, wouldn't you want to go follow whoever's... I mean, I mean, if I come in here and just beat me up... You're going to follow him. I, 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 I ain't going to follow him. <laughs> I won't run from him. Yeah, I, I mean, that that's persecution perhaps did something for this guy. I, you know, I mean... Is it possible this is another two-name scenario that Christus, after kind of going through his conversion to following Christ... Just have you mean just he has another name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I think that's the question. Is is this one guy or is there two two guys here? And um, my guess is it's probably two different guys, but um, that's possible that it's the same guy. And he has he has two names. They all a lot of them had two names. I have three names. Well, but yeah, that's that's a possibility. That's why it's kind of hard to to know for sure, but. Um, yeah, Ryan. This may be uh, a stupid question, but what, what stake did the Greeks have? Say that again. What stake, what, what, what motive did the Greeks have for meeting being the sauce in the first place? Well, since it really wasn't their issue. Right. So I, I don't know, again, if this is, if, if the, the people that are doing this are part of Gallio's court administrative people 
then it's probably their way of saying we could care less about this. Just let's hurry up, get this over with. Just give them a beating and let's move on. Um, we don't need to take this any further. Uh, it, it, there's no really no rhyme or reason to the beating, I don't think, um, in, you know, personally. But they did that. They did that in Acts. Even the apostles from time to time got got beaten. Seems like for no reason. Why, why are you just beating them for, and then you're gonna let them go? Um, it could be. Yeah, it, it could be the Jews. Um, but again, I think there's, I think there's that's left up for interpretation in the text. Um, because Gallio was in charge of this, this court. He was in charge of this system. Um, yes, here where it says he drove, drove them from the tribunal, and then they see Sosthenes. It almost seems like every, the Bible's kicked out of the tribunal, even though the people that were there. And then they didn't get their justice there, so they took it upon themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another way, another way to look at that. Um, my mind says he drove them from the tribunal, and they all see Sosthenes, the ruler. So, yeah, I, I, either way, I, I don't think it really uh, plays too big of a, a part in the overall message. But it could be the Jews. Um, yeah. That's a good question, although... Um, just from a the context, God said He wasn't going to let him be harmed. So you know He says He says I'm not going to. Uh, uh, no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. So I, and I don't know if that means that there were some in this court or a part of the Jews that liked Paul that he that were gods and he they were able to let's get you out of here before this gets worse. Uh, maybe they protected and saved him from that. I don't know, but. Uh, God fulfilled that promise to Paul here. But that, that's a good question. It, it, yeah, it makes you, there's not a question we could ever answer, but like, why does God let him get persecuted in some of these places pretty badly, and then another place, uh, you're not going to get harmed in this place. You're just going to get out of here. Yeah, a lot so. of the places where he gets persecuted, he then leaves. Right. And so it seems like there was too much for him to do here to leave. Yeah, I mean, the last few chapters, he's been on the run, basically. And now he's able to stay a while. He does leave, but he's not harmed. So, yeah, I don't know all the ins and outs of all that. Um, Sostings takes his place here. All right, anything else on that? You know what Shane Scott always says about sauce things? He got the truth beat into him. That's what he says. No. <laughs> All right. So that basically wraps up the second missionary journey. Um, in verse 18, after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with them Priscilla and Aquila. So they leave and go with Paul. At Sincrea, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. Um, there's, I guess there's debate upon what that vow is, whether it's some kind of a, a Nazarite vow or um, w what that necessarily could have been. It doesn't last. It's, it's one that's temporary. They came to Ephesus, and he left from them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined, but on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. All right, so when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and he greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. This is, seems to be his, his start-off place and end place. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So he ends back at Antioch. He's going to start again the third journey from there. And 
basically the third journey is just a revisiting of the places where he's already established churches, whether it was with Barnabas or it's Silas and Timothy. And that's what we're going to see now. Uh, so 24 to 28, some of them read that. Okay, uh, an interesting little section here with Apollos. Um, so Aquila and Priscilla, they you know, kind of can track their journey now. Uh, they were in Rome, they come to Corinth, and then they go to Ephesus with Paul as he finished his second missionary journey. And on his way as he's going to come back, Paul's going to come back to Ephesus here in chapter 19. But we kind of come back to Apollos um, or we come back to Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus, and they run across Apollos, this native of Alexandria, who has come to Ephesus. And what's it say about him? Okay, what else? Okay, what else? Okay. Yeah, so he's been instructed in the way of the Lord. He's fervent in spirit. Um, but he also, it says, spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. So that's a kind of an interesting statement. And I'm going to open this up for um, some, que or some discussion, not questions. That would be bad of me. Uh, but for to some discussion, he was teaching accurately Jesus, even though he only knew the baptism of John. Uh, how did he do that? How do you teach accurately Jesus, even though you're not teaching the baptism of Jesus? Okay. Okay. So he's a follower, a disciple of John, um, and who also pointed to Jesus until he's kind of um, matured, maybe in his knowledge. Okay. Other thoughts? Yeah, but I think it's interesting. I always like the way that it, it talks about they taught him even more accurately. So his, I mean, it just seems like he did have uh, what he was teaching was correct. Uh, he just there was more he needed to learn, uh, and so I like that. You know, he's never condemned. He's never like it's never spoken against what he's doing. He's yeah, just, it's just there's still room to grow. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I like that too. That there's not a rebuke. Um, when it says he taught accurately Jesus, he was teaching the truth about Jesus. Um, that does not mean that there wasn't room for him to grow and to learn more about Jesus and what Jesus was about and what he had to offer. Um, Priscilla and Aquila seemed to be needing to help him further the, his knowledge of Jesus. But he, what he was teaching was right up to the point. So um, the, the, the question is, I guess, um, well, before I go on, what, any other thoughts on that?
Okay, okay. So let me let let me ask let me ask another question about this. Um, I, ha I had the way I wanted to word that, and now I've lost it. <clears throat> What, what do you think, what's a possibility as to what it is he needed to know more about Jesus? Baptism. Okay, the baptism the and the Holy Spirit. So what was it that John taught about Jesus' baptism? John the Baptist, that is. What did he teach about Jesus' baptism? About Jesus in general. Jesus would be mightier than he. That's right. He said, one is coming who is greater than I. And he is going to baptize you with the spirit and fire. So there's something about Jesus that's greater. And part of that, the great extent of that, is that he offers the spirit of God that John couldn't do. And he was preparing them for the one who would give them the spirit. So perhaps this is an option that perhaps Apollos isn't familiar um, with the news that Jesus... Well, before I go there, <laughs> I know I'm getting confusing. What, what has to happen for the Spirit to come? Jesus, and what about him? His death and his resurrection. Once you hit Acts 2, Peter explains this has happened. And what do they have? They're receiving the Spirit. Perhaps one of the things that has happened here is that Apollos, maybe he's not familiar with the fact that Jesus has died or has resurrected. He probably, maybe he's heard that he's died. Maybe he hasn't heard that he's resurrected and that he's ascended as king to the right hand of God. That's a possibility. Um, the question would be why. Uh, Jesus died in AD 30 to 33, somewhere around there. Ephesus, we talked about, is probably in the 50s. So 25 years later, um, obviously Acts is telling us that they're getting that news all over the place. Paul has been to these places. But who knows? Maybe Apollos was somewhere visiting some other country and hadn't heard about this yet. Uh, maybe he'd heard about John. He'd been a follower of his, but, and he knew about Jesus, and he was still preaching Jesus. Maybe he, wasn't, maybe he was preaching that he was coming, and he's the one to follow, but maybe he didn't know that he had come and already ascended. I don't know, but that's a possibility. Yeah, I guess. He's from Alexandria. Mm -hmm. which is pretty far away from Jerusalem and pretty far away from all the activities that uh, the apostles were engaged in. And uh, he, he is not an inspired man like the apostles, but he is a, a very good Bible student and very eloquent speaker. And in the next chapter, when Paul comes to Ephesus, he wants to know about, well, you know, why would you receive the Spirit? And evidently, Apollos had been teaching there, you know, the baptism of John, and they accepted it, and it was it was accurate as far as he knew. But uh, I'm impressed with him. Uh, evidently, he accepts the instruction of Aquila and Priscilla very graciously, and he just makes him the complete preacher now. He can yeah. tell the whole story. That's right. And uh, they can have assurance that uh, someone greater than John has come yeah. in Christ. Yeah, I, that's, that's a very good way of putting that. And, what, I mean, what, what, do you, what do you all make of Aquila and Priscilla here? I mean, what, what evangelistic uh, example are they? All right, they're encouraging. They're working as a couple. Um, you know, is, again, it's not just a, a preacher that does the evangelistic work. Other people do that. 
And they seem to be going around from place to place and helping people just like Paul was. Yeah, Ryan? I think their approach is really Yeah. How they dealt with someone that wasn't necessarily having a complete picture. Um, I feel like it's definitely applicable in terms of evangelism that you don't need to necessarily at all times just make someone in public or in front of other people because that's just going to close your ears. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way that Luke puts that, that they, they, um, explain to him the way of God more accurately is almost a, it's just like almost a sincere, kind way of, of working, taking them by the hand and working with them and saying, you're almost there, but let, let's work a little bit further together and see if we can come to a fuller understanding of the truth. I think there are a lot of religious people that we're probably around that maybe don't see everything the way that we see it. And I think in, in some instances, maybe our instinct is to try and show them where they're wrong as opposed to like what we see here is, you know, they see what he's doing right and build on that. Mm -hmm. And I think just that attitude is probably you're going to reach more people um, if you're trying to build on what they know as opposed to try and just tear them down completely before you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. That, that, that I think they learn, they're learn, they've learned something from Paul. I mean, this is, this is how he handled... Um, those in Athens, isn't it? I mean, he, he got to where they were on their ground, and he didn't, I mean, he did deal with um, their lack of knowledge, but he started with, hey, I'm religious just like you are. And uh, I noticed this unknown God business over here. I want to talk to you about that God that you don't know, and I want to help you know him. Also putting yourself in that time period, too, with all those there that's teaching, he probably has some people already talking out against him. So you're going to have two people that kind of are following the message and like, yes, you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. Also speak out against you. That's going to turn even more people's ears possibly away. Versus saying like, okay, like, this is better. And then we did decide to say, but here's some more. Because if we speak out against you now, these people that were already questioning, now you have this group also questioning. Yeah. That could actually turn more followers away. Yep. Going back to what Clark was saying, Second Timothy, he says, you know, that uh, the servant of the Lord must not strive to be gentle to all men, after to use patience and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So that's the way you teach other people, not you know, rubbing their nose in it and being aggressive. And that's, you know, you're wrong, but do it in a, in a loving, meekness type of way, instructing those that oppose themselves. Yeah, that's a very good point. And on the flip side of that, you know, Gis was mentioning uh, um, Apollos here and how he handled this. E even the, the way that that's, the way that you are, um, he, they, they, he, he really wasn't rebuked, but the way that he, they, they talked to him and helped him allowed him to probably have a better attitude towards this, but you also appreciate him, the humility to be told, you're on the right track, but you don't got it. <laughs> you don't. You don't have it right. I know that wasn't correct lang um, English, but um, his humility to be able to say, "Hey, let me listen more. Let me uh, let me get it right." Um, it works both ways, and uh, so you appreciate him as well for his response to Paul. Yeah, I guess. I think that uh, when it says they tell him the way of the Lord more perfectly or explain. More accurately, what they did was gave him the what he needed to know that we now know that he can refute the Jews, showing in scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. That seemed to be something he wasn't quite able to do yet until he received this instruction. And I think it's more than just the baptism of Jesus that he learned about, but it's the whole idea of Jesus being the Christ of the Old Testament scriptures. That's what he did. Right. And that's what he knew. And they put it all together after this couple has taught him about Jesus way more perfectly. So they just uh, completed what he needed. Yeah. And uh, from then on, 
He's like Stephen. The Jews evidently could not withstand his wisdom because he he had this knowledge. That right. Yeah. That's good. Do what? The rest of the story. The rest of the story. That's all right. That's basically what they did. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Uh, now your rest of the story. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like, outside of uh, Athens, if you think of like ancient, ancient cities and thought and education and the value that was placed on it, like, it's those two cities pretty much. Yeah. And so it's, it's just kind of cool that, you know, I wonder how much that, that, that value that they put on education and, and intellectual ability that led them to be such a, a type of yeah, yeah. He's probably next to Paul as the most educated. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. We read probably. Yeah, very, Paul very likely. Paul in First Corinthians. He says, you know, that uh, I planted in Apollos water, and God gave an increase. So that's the co-working of uh, Christians together. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. And chapter nineteen. That's you know. Paulus is going to be in Corinth, um, working there. So, yeah, very good. Anything else while Logan's coming up, I guess? Okay. Yeah, so Dawn is not here. She's uh, been sick. And um, uh, Megan's surgery is Friday. She's had pre-op already. Is that right? Okay. Let's remember her. Um, let's remember Rick's daughter, Shannon. I think that everybody probably got the text. I think that was sent out. So let's, let's pray for her and his family. Um, and this is is this for anybody to do? Yeah, if they, so okay. So there there are is kind of a, a bulletin of our singing at Cane Ridge, and there are envelopes with stamps already on them. If you want to send one to a friend or to somebody you know that you think would enjoy this, um, they're up here to do so. And I think that would be good. It's coming up on us. May 22nd. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this, the, what, what we have here is going to be in the Advocate next week. So, but if you want one of these to send to somebody, they're up here. All right. Any. else all right Steve I think you're down for the closing prayer Heavenly Father thank you for the ability for us to gather here today to study your word to meditate on your word and let it strengthen us and renew us and guide us in our current endeavors Please be with those that were unable to be here tonight due to illness, injury. Be with those that are mentioned, those family members, Shannon, and others that are not able to be with us today. Please help renew them, ease their burdens, watch over them if that is your will. And those that are also near them, give them the strength and endurance to continue to guide and help them through these tough times. Please continue to be with us as we approach Sunday to continue to meditate on your word and your will, to continue to strive to grow in you and love and try to be more like your son 
who did so much for us and sacrificed himself for us. And we ask all this through his name, Jesus Christ. Amen.